uh, Lee's, of course, has taken a little bit of a hit. So when he shows up here on the afternoon at Catoosa Station, on the afternoon of mid-afternoon of September the 19th, he's bringing a lot of gravitas, a lot of weight with him. And that leads Bragg on that night uh, in the middle of a pitch battle to appoint Longstreet as one of his wing commanders, something that is never uh, even hardly heard of to change the command structure that much in the midst of a battle. So uh, I think you can get an idea that all these things are going on at the same time and it doesn't fare well for the Confederates. Well, we focus a lot on the, uh, the, the contentious and fractured um, uh, and fractious relationship between Bragg and his senior subordinates, uh, men like uh, William Joseph Hardy and Leona Despolk and Simon Bolivar Buckner and Daniel Harvey Hill and James Longstreet. Um, the, um, uh, but uh, there were some Bragg supporters, um, and um, I thought I would maybe um, query you all and um, see who um, you all might put on the, uh, the pro Bragg teams. <laughs> oh, whatever. Yeah, well, Jefferson Davis, yeah. yes. Well, gosh, I, mean, I guess I should just do that then. The, the Davis Bragg relationship. I think a lot of people, a lot of people are aware that the two guys supported each other, but I think probably for the wrong reason. Many people say that it's because Davis and Bragg were personal friends, and as Stephen Woodworth in his studies have pointed out, that's not true, and it's absolutely true that the two men, the two men had a long relationship. They knew they knew <coughs> each other in the Mexican War. They fought together on the same battlefield, Buena Vista, where it was a brilliant American victory. Uh, Davis was Secretary of uh, War in the 1850s and instituted some reforms of the artillery service that Bragg didn't like and resigned from the army because of that and hated Davis for many years afterward. In the early part of this, it, by the way, that was a hatred that Davis did not reciprocate. He continued to respect Bragg and like him and think that he was a, a good officer. In the early days of the Civil War, Davis was instrumental in getting Bragg into the Confederate Army and he accepted that position, and slowly Bragg began to realize that the Confederate president wasn't his enemy at all, but was a supporter. The two men respected each other on a personal level and a professional level. Davis actually kept Bragg in command of the Army of Tennessee so long, and Bragg commanded that army longer than anybody else did, was something like 20 months, I forget exactly how many. And Davis consistently said in letter after letter, the reason is because he's a good administrator, and a good general, and there's no, and especially there's nobody better than him to replace him anyway. So just keep him in, in, in place. And that's the real reason that he was, he was a Bragg supporter. Bragg eventually realized that and used Davis in fights against his subordinate generals on more than one occasion to call in the president. Okay, if the president supports me, then I can, I, I can deal with insubordination and lack of confidence among my chief subordinates. So Bragg, maybe in a kind of a Machiavellian way, kind of took advantage of that, if you can say it on one level. I also found, too, in my research that on more than one occasion, Braxton Bragg expressed a, a genuine desire to want to leave the command of the Army of Tennessee because he got sick of dealing with his subordinates. But he always said that Davis won't let me that I have, to, I have to support him. And Bragg grew into a very, very strong supporter of the president. When, when, he finally, when Davis finally had to get rid of him, and Bragg finally sent in his resignation after the debacle of uh, Missionary Ridge, uh, he rested for a while, and Davis named him his military advisor in Richmond, a promotion, basically. From that point on, Bragg was Davis's man 100%. And he supported the president in Davis's arguments and long-term fight against Joseph E. Johnston, for example. Basically, Bragg was instrumental in getting Johnston relieved from command of the Army of Tennessee in July of 1864 in the middle of the Atlanta campaign, even though months before Johnston had gone to bat and supported Bragg in the wake of the Stones River campaign, when Bragg's job was on, was on the line. And Johnston came to the Army of Tennessee uh, in January. He investigated. He strongly wrote to the president, Bragg did very well at Stones River. It would be criminal to relieve him. 
and yet Bragg did not hesitate to, in essence, kind of stab Johnston in the back a little bit in July of 64. And the reason is because he was firmly in Davis's camp by that time. And he considered that to be his duty as the military advisor to, to the president, to the Confederate president, uh, to support the president. By the end of the Civil War, by early 65, Bragg and Davis are referring to each other in their letters as dear friend. So they developed a personal friendship by that time that lasted for the rest of their lives. Okay, other Bragg supporters, just very briefly. He had supporters in the Army of Tennessee, but the thing was they tended to be brigade commanders, some division commanders. The other thing about them is that they sincerely liked Bragg and they strongly supported him. They thought he was a good general. The other important thing is they all decided not to say anything publicly about their support of Bragg. They were quiet friends, and Bragg's enemies were very loud and vocal. That's a big difference, isn't it? You'd like to have it the other way, wouldn't you? But Bragg can't have, can't have that. He had, he had a, quite a bit of support in the Army of Tennessee, but gosh, those guys wrote quiet letters to him saying, you're right, keep going. They never would say anything publicly. And Bragg's enemies could say anything they wanted to and get away with it. Uh, he had supporters among the rank and file, too. I found quite a lot of letters. Even after the, the horrible defeat at, Stone, uh, at Missionary Ridge, people were still writing to him. After he's relieved of command in December of 63 and in early 64, in his papers at the Western Reserve Historical Society, numerous letters written by men in the Army of Tennessee saying, we miss you. We wish you would come back. We don't know where the army's going. What can we do to replace you? It, well into 64, he gets letters like this from people. But again, these people are not writing letters to the editor of the newspaper or writing to Jefferson Davis or anybody like that. They're just writing to their friend. One guy wrote to, to Bragg saying, you're like a father to me. So Bragg was not friendless. And he was not incapable of creating loyalty among subordinates. It's just that, and then there's another category of people who were split, who liked Bragg, but were frustrated with him because, because they recognized his good qualities, coexisted with his bad qualities, and the bad qualities tended to overall the good qualities. And they got St. John R. Liddell <coughs> of Louisiana, a brigade commander of the Army of Tennessee, wrote a wonderful memoir after the Civil War. And he's constantly saying, how much he talked to Bragg, he tried to convince Bragg to do this and to do that. He had faith in him, but he was always so frustrated with Bragg because Bragg was, he thought, kind of obtuse. And in the end, not a very effective commander because of that complex, as you guys have mentioned, and, and sometimes contradictory set of personality traits that Bragg, Bragg exhibited. To illustrate on the Davis point, there's a quote that I always like to use. Uh, in 1860, when uh, Bragg is in Louisiana, uh, the secession crisis is just unfolding. This is December 1860. Bragg and his wife have dinner with William Sherman. Uh, and at one point, uh, Bragg's wife leans over when they have a moment, uh, and, and she tells Sherman, you know uh, President Davis is no friend of my husband. And then, but you see by the end of the war how close, uh, how closely intertwined Davis and Bragg will become. I always found that very interesting. Um, the Army does have uh, a substantial number of Bragg supporters. Uh, in my study, I, I noticed that uh, uh, there's a very clear hierarchy. The closer you are to Bragg, the less likely you are to be a, his friend. Uh, probably the only significant corps commander uh, uh, in the Army of Tennessee, uh, who is a, a, a staunch Bragg supporter, is William H.T. Walker, uh, and he's the, the most junior corps commander. He's often uh, uh, drops back down to division command. Um, Bragg also has um, a core of support from those troops that began the war with him, those officers who served with him in uh, uh, Pensacola in 1861 uh, and were originally Bragg's army or Bragg's uh, corps when it was transferred to uh, uh, and, and organized at Corinth in the larger army of Mississippi which will eventually become the army of Tennessee. 
they took pride in being brag men. They thought they were they had greater discipline than, uh, as Bragg put it, Polk's mob. Uh, but uh, but Bragg was a difficult man to work for, and, and as we've alluded to, some of the reason I think that uh, that Bragg has these problems with quiet friends as opposed to outspoken friends is that. Um, he can take even his friends to task, uh, sometimes uh, thoughtlessly. Bragg, uh, Bragg's positive qualities are in organization, in discipline, uh, uh, even in military strategy. Uh, but, but to go back to that point about leadership, about team building, he's not a man uh, who, who can make you feel better about yourself even in the midst of defeat. Uh, say like Robert E. Lee could, or there's, there's a number of other generals who uh, who managed to accomplish this sort of thing. Uh, I I think that uh, Bragg's uh, Bragg's friends in the end become very frustrated with him, uh, and uh, but they're not going to like what comes after Bragg either, which. Uh, the, uh, one thing that does strike me about uh, about the debacle after Missionary Ridge is that I'm not sure that Braxton Bragg expected that his resignation would be accept accepted when he finally wrote his letter of resignation in early December. Uh, he had been sustained enough by Davis at that point that um, I wonder if he thought that he would once again be sustained, the resignation would be refused, and he would uh, remain in command of the army. Uh, that turned out not to be true, uh, and, and the history of the war changed at that point, but, but I've always kind of thought that, uh, at least in part, Bragg expected to continue on in command. I'll let you go ahead there. <clears throat> I think they've covered that very well, and, and my time, I'd like to pose a question back to these two gentlemen. Uh, it's interesting to me that most of Bragg's supporters were brigade commanders, you know, and the occasional division commander, and not the corps commanders. And as Dr. Hess alluded, the closer that you worked with Bragg, the more that you might have disliked him. But I'd like to ask the blunt question, why do you think that's true? Why do you think uh, the brigade commanders would be more supportive of Bragg and not the corps commanders. Well, I, um, I, this is the way I would approach that question, Robert. Uh, first of all, there, there were very few corps commanders in the Army of Tennessee. A small group of them, for much of the time that Bragg commanded the Army, there were only two, Leonidas Polk and William J. Hardy. And I don't want to dump on Leonidas Polk too much. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. This is very interesting. I, I do dump on Polk in the, in the Bragg book. And generally speaking, most people say, yeah, yeah. There are a small group of Polk patriots out there in the Civil War community who get livid with anger at that. Well, my view of Polk is thoroughly negative. I think from day one, he was a pain in the butt to Bragg and to any sense of professionalism among the core leadership in the Army of Tennessee. That's a bold statement, isn't it? But I think it's true. I, 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 it boggles my mind that a corps commander in the Confederate Army continually writes letters to Jefferson Davis, or private letters, criticizing his, his officer, his commander in chief. And Davis lets him get away with it. What would happen if William T. Sherman did that, wrote letters to Abraham Lincoln saying Grant is a drunken fool and Lincoln doesn't do anything about it? That's, that's the scenario that you have in the Western Confederacy. And it's because the true friendship here is Jefferson Davis and Leonidas Polk. Polk, I think, was thoroughly incompetent for his high position in every sense of the word, virtually. And Davis got, let him get away with it continually all the time. Bragg was frustrated and detested Pope from the very first day that they met each other in March of 62. 
and he put, basically put up with Polk for a long, long time because he knew he couldn't do anything about him because Polk had this wonderful friend in Richmond who supported him all the time. Uh, my, my point is that I think that Polk is the primary reason why you have this poisonous command relationship with the Army of Tennessee. And I think Hardy kind of, re, kind of learned a little bit. Of, Hardy is not a firm enemy of Bragg. He kind, he kind of waffles here and there. Hardy does have a greater sense of professionalism and what's proper, but sometimes he seems to be infected by the Polk attitude and acts like Polk and kind of allies with him sometimes, like after Stones River, for example. And bringing in John Bell Hood into the, the core leadership in the Army of Tennessee, Hood very readily was seduced by Polk, I think, because Hood began to learn from, from Polk, his mentor, this backbiting thing, because Hood also had a personal friendship with Jefferson Davis. He also was writing letters to the president saying, gosh, Johnson is retreating too much, this is awful, forgetting to tell Davis that Hood himself was responsible for many of Johnson's retreats rather than attacks through the Army of uh, during the, the Atlanta campaign. I really think that so much of the reason why the core commander leadership doesn't like Bragg stems from Leonidas Polk rather than from any objective kind of uh, personal reaction on everybody's part toward Bragg independently of how Polk is, is kind of influencing them. I guess that's my take on it. Uh, maybe it's true that if you're less away from, uh, more away from Bragg that you have a better opinion of him, but that's probably just because you know, if I was close to Bragg and dealt with him every day, I probably wouldn't like him either. Uh, he was intense. He was, he, he, Bragg had a mania for discipline. Discipline was a big D word with him, and that ruled his concept of life. By the way, you mentioned Sherman. One of the most interesting things that, that struck me, Bragg and Sherman were friends before the Civil War. Bragg liked Sherman more than Sherman liked Bragg, but they, were, they had a friendship. And Bragg wrote a series of letters in the 1850s to his friend Sherman explaining his views of life and how important discipline was. And those are wonderful, interesting, insightful uh, letters to Bragg's personality. By the way, during the course of the Civil War, Sherman admired Bragg's uh, leadership most of the good things you can read about Bragg's generalship are written by Union generals, by the way. That's another interesting point. Bragg got a lot more respect from his enemy than he did from his friends. That, that's a fascinating aspect of, of, of his life, I think. By the end of the Civil War, Bragg detested Sherman. He, wrote, he mentions him in some letters as, as the scourge of the South and as a barbarian for the march to the sea and the march to the Carolinas. But within a couple of years after the Civil War was over, they had a... They had a <coughs> in agreement with each other. They came, became friends again. Sherman even invited Bragg